Good afternoon, and thank you again for joining us. Um, I have just a few statements to make uh, prior to answering your questions. Um, first is that the CDC has recommended that when people are out in the community, that in addition to doing social distancing and good hand washing, good hand hygiene and sneeze and cough etiquette, um, that we should be wearing face coverings um, when we were out and about. And Northern Light Health supports this um, and we encourage people who are visiting our facilities, whether that be our hospitals, our clinics, um, or even if you're part of our home care and having people come in from, to provide health care at home, that, that our, the general public wears those face coverings when um, appropriate. And so we ask then that people come in and they can wear either a mask um, or a scarf or a bandana or um, one of those wind sleeves that one can pull up from their neck over their mouth and nose. And the reason behind this is to help to prevent the spread of the disease. Um, it keeps us, if we happen to be infected and be asymptomatic, it keeps us from spreading the disease to other individuals. And just like we asking our healthcare workers to wear masks at all of our facilities um, during healthcare in order to protect you, um, our patients, our community, and ourselves, we're asking you to do the same. And so we support that and we encourage you all to do that. Um, and this is not a replacement for social distancing. It is important that when we are out of our homes that we are remaining at least six feet away from other individuals, um, as this again is, a, is the major way that we can help prevent the spread of, of COVID-19 um, and get our communities back to the point where we, we need them to be. I did wanna go over some numbers from, from Northern Light. Um, as of this morning, we have a total of 11 positive COVID cases that uh, Northern Light providers are taking care of. The majority of those are actually uh, within our home and hospice care agencies um, and not admitted to the hospital, and that's a good thing. Um, in, in total, we have tested 3,762 individuals from our Northern Light lab testing facility, um, of which 112 of those are positive. I will remind your viewers that uh, these numbers seem low, and that is because we are still, ma the majority of the people we are testing are those in that tier one category, individuals who are sick enough to require hospitalization, uh, first responders and healthcare workers, and then those living in congregate living situations like nursing homes, long-term care facilities, shelters, and the like. And so while the numbers may be low, we do know that there is community spread and it has been widely publicized that there is community spread in at least nine of, uh, in at least four of our counties. And in the remaining counties, we know that it is there as well as we have had positive cases now in all counties in Maine. Lastly, I want to touch on some myths that have been floating around and kind of dispel some of them. Uh, one was that as the weather turns nicer and it's a little bit warmer that this will be an effective way of preventing spread of the virus because heat kills the virus. I will say that no, it is not enough that the temperatures are warming up. We know that around the world there are some places um, in, in the southern hemisphere where they have experienced summer months already and they had just as many cases um, as we have seen in the northern hemisphere. And so uh, warmer weather does not mean that the, that the virus itself uh, will, be, will be killed. Um, and so I just wanted to, to, to put that out there. And also, again, just to remind us all that social distancing is the most important way that we can help uh, prevent this spread. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Paul for some good news. Thanks, Dr. Jarvis. I uh, just wanted to point out our caregivers uh, throughout the state uh, continue to receive uh, very positive feedback from the community. Um, and that's certainly very welcomed, uh, the work that they're doing uh, is nothing short of heroic, uh, and uh, we certainly want to continue to support and recognize caregivers. Um, for example, uh, one, one example, Serena Cole of Stockton Springs uh, produced uh, headbands uh, for healthcare workers uh, to attach their face masks to. Um, in, in prolonged use, the face masks can irritate the skin behind your ears, and so having the headbands with little buttons on them uh, provides a way to uh, have a more comfortable wearing of the, uh, of the face masks uh, throughout the entire shift. And so um, that's one example, uh, and we continue to see um, a, a very strong support from the community, and that's certainly very welcome uh, during this time especially. All right, now we'll move on to questions. I'll call on each media organization and I'll unmute you. You'll have a chance to ask two questions. Uh, if time permits, we'll go through and give everyone a chance to ask an additional question. The order of media organizations today will be WABI, Bangalore Daily News, WBII, WERU, New Center Maine, Ellsworth American, and the Morning Sentinel. So we'll kick off the question and answer portion with Brianna Beers from WABI. Brianna, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Jarvis, do you think you could touch on a little bit about how 
there's maybe a myth going around. Maybe it's not a myth. Um, if it can be transmitted from your shoes to your home. So the question was, uh, is it possible that uh, the virus can be uh, transmitted from your shoes to your home, um, other clothing as well? Again, this is one of those stories where it is, it is possible, it is just not probable, um, that the, vir the virus does, we know, live on uh, hard surfaces like wood and cardboard um, for a longer period of time than softer surfaces, porous surfaces like clothing. Um, it is a possibility. Out in the general public, it is unlikely. Um, this this uh, story probably came from the fact that we are we are recommending uh, that healthcare providers who are working directly with individuals who are infected with COVID-19 that uh, one of the ways they can protect themselves and their families when they go home is to change their footwear um, and wear protective things. Uh, again, it is unlikely that in the general population that that would be a way of transmission, um, but it is a concern for our healthcare workers. Thank you. That's all I have right now. Thank you, Brianna. Hi, thank you. Uh, Northern Light Health has or is affiliated with a number of long-term care facilities and I was hoping that you could talk specifically about those and um, provide an update on the number of COVID-19 cases they have, whether the case, cases are among patients or staff and what the outcomes have been, whether anyone has had to be hospitalized or has died. So our policy at Northern Light is not to share specific information about our specific healthcare facilities. Um, I will tell you that our numbers overall across all of our 10 hospitals as well as our long-term care facilities are, are, are very low and we're grateful for that and, and hope that that continues. Um, we do know that some of our partnerships do have um, do have some positive cases. Uh, right now I'm unaware that any of those cases have needed to come to the facility, uh, to one of our facilities for care, and I unfortunately can't comment on whether anybody has died um, outside of one of our facilities, uh, one of our uh, acute care facilities um, on that. Um, again, we do know that uh, several of the long-term care facilities across the state have had outbreaks, um, and we have, we as Northern Light um, have partnered with a lot of those um, long-term care facilities to help and assist them uh, as they deal with that particular area within their health care facility. Um, and so we, we continue to do that and work on a regular basis. But uh, I won't, I'm not going to comment on, a, on, on actual numbers, though. Thank you. Um, in terms of uh, you know, the gear that you have on hand, the protective gear, uh, could you talk about that? What, what do you have on hand in terms of protective gear and resources? How, and in particular, how have you seen it change and how are you anticipating the availability changing? Uh, for instance, can you speak to the, the uh, supply of N95 masks that you have? Have you calculated a reliable burn rate? Um, how many ICU beds are in use versus available and open? How many ventilators are in use versus um, you know, are available and how many or any other equipment you want to discuss? Sure. So the question was about uh, the, the availability of, of personal protective equipment for our staff um, as well as the capacity within our critical care units and uh, the capacity for our ventilators. Um, again, our usage has been small because our numbers of, of actual positive patients at Northern Light facilities has been relatively small. Um, we were preparing for a much worse surge here in the state of Maine than what has happened uh, so far. Um, so I can say that very safely that we are in a very good spot. Uh, we can continue to monitor our supply chain for our personal protective equipment and on at least a daily basis, if not more often than that, are actually calculating out what our burn rate is to make sure that we have appropriate equipment for all of our staff. And right now we feel that is, that is the case. And in fact, we've expanded the usage of some of our personal protective equipment based on information from the CDC and our own internal calculations. So that's important for people to know, that when you come to one of our facilities, you are coming to a safe environment. We are very fortunate in the state of Maine with our low numbers and the fact that we prepared very well for this. As far as the number of critical care beds and ventilators, we are well, um, uh, uh, we are in, in a very good situation as far as those go. 
Um, we are very well situated there, um, even across the state. And so yesterday I actually had a meeting with some, some of our state leaders talking about this. Uh, our utilization of both our critical care beds and our ventilators across the state is actually down compared to normal, simply because we're not, we're not seeing those elective cases that often require ventilatory support. Um, and, and our overall usage at our hospitals, particularly those large medical centers, is down. And again, that was done on purpose for us to be prepared in case we did see large numbers of individuals uh, with COVID-19. So across the state, I think we are very well situated. And this is Paul Bull, and I can follow hey. up. I can oh, add some, a, a little bit of commentary in addition to Dr. Jarvis's comments. We've seen uh, a tremendous uh, results from the hard work of our supply chain uh, group um, who are working with suppliers, uh, both traditional suppliers as well as new suppliers, uh, some local uh, and national uh, uh, suppliers. And we've seen even uh, the availability of N95s and other, other PPE um, available on the internet and other, and other locations, uh, some of which is actually uh, not uh, a medical grade equipment. And so um, it's, it's very important that as we're looking for personal protective equipment options, uh, for, uh, for our healthcare workers, um, that our staff are ensuring that, that, that the, uh, the masking and other uh, products are, are actually legitimate uh, healthcare quality products and not uh, counterfeit or, or otherwise uh, not suitable for a healthcare environment. So there's a number of uh, uh, things out there uh, for purchase, uh, but, uh, but in terms of uh, supply chain and legitimate healthcare quality, uh, products um, that supply is is more finite and requires the uh, the, the careful eye uh, of clinical experts uh, and uh, uh, the uh, the work of our supply chain. Okay, next we have ABC Seven Fox Twenty Two. TJ, you're up. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Jarvis. Hey, TJ, how are you doing? All right. I'm curious. What are the pros and cons with all the issues with long term? Facilities. What are the pros and cons about just going in and testing all the workers and residents of all the long-term facilities in the state? So the question was, is should we go in and test all of the, the healthcare workers and the residents at our long-term care facilities across the state? I think many of us in the healthcare world wish that we had the opportunity to do that and do more testing. Um, unfortunately, we continue to be hampered by supply chain regarding testing capabilities and uh, testing resources. Um, and so that has really limited what we can do. Uh, the state has set up a very good protocol for when they do go into a long-term care facility to do testing. Um, it is based on a, on a number of, of residents at that particular facility who become positive um, and based on symptoms of those who, before they become before they are tested for being positive um, we support that decision and we have been uh, working in concert with the main CDC um, with several of our long-term care facilities to carry out that um, process when it needs to be done um, but unfortunately due to the limitation of, uh, of the number of reagents we have to run tests across the entire state um, at this time we can't continue to expand out widespread testing though I do think it would be valuable particularly in that population. Mr. Baldwin. Yes sir. A few weeks ago you were talking about the options available for Northern employees. I think one of those was uh, a voluntary furlough. Have you had many employees take you up on that? Sure. So the question was uh, the number of employees who've requested uh, voluntary furlough. Um, the numbers continue to be relatively low. Uh, I know that it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 um, have opted uh, to request a voluntary furlough. Um, that uh, that number uh, is is expected to change, uh, you know, periodically. But we're not expecting uh, large numbers of uh, you know, a voluntary furloughs, but that's cer certainly an option uh, for employees in, in some positions. Sure. All right, next we have Amy Brown, WERU. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jarvis, could you repeat the number of total tests again? I didn't catch that. 3,762, those are tests that were done, that were performed at Northern Lights Laboratory. That is not the inclusive number of all the tests we had done because initially we were relying on the state laboratory um, until we were able to do the testing in-house. Okay, 
Have you seen the demand for testing drop at all? No, actually, we've seen the demand in some, in some ways go down, but really the demand is increasing as uh, we would like to start preparing for when we can get back to what we, whatever normal life is going to look like for us. Um, we have had to increase some of our testing because we do have in patients that uh, need to go to leave our acute care facilities and get to convalescence. And uh, right now we are testing some individuals in order to get them into long-term care facilities or skilled facilities. So that has increased the number of tests that we have done. Um, and then there's been some, uh, some more medical knowledge around aerosolizing generating procedures. And we have increased testing um, in order to support the ability to perform those particular sp procedures when patients need them. And so uh, our testing actually has gone up a little bit in some areas and down in others. It's just a matter of uh, which, which category we're looking at for testing. Okay, can I ask one more question, please? Please. Okay, the N95 masks, if there's no vaccine for another year and not a treatment found in that time, if we were able to ramp up production of the N95 masks to the point where not only were healthcare facilities completely adequately stocked, but the general public could start wearing them again, would that be enough protection for most people if they had a supply of those and you know had them fitted correctly that they could go back to work and be safe? I think that's an excellent question. The question was is if there was a if there was a an, a near unlimited supply of N95s, would we be recommending that those kind of masks not just be used in healthcare facilities uh, but for the general community? The issue there is exactly as you pointed out about fit testing. These masks are designed to fit on the on a face in a particular manner to make it so that air can't get in from the sides. Um, I will say that I I was out uh, in the general public public uh, over the weekend. Um, I noticed several people wearing N95 masks, most likely ones that were built for industry, not for healthcare, um, and they were all being worn inappropriately and incorrectly. That is the problem with, with a mask such as that that's designed to be fitted to somebody's face. Um, and that the size is important uh, because it could leave big gaps between the actual mask and the side of your face where again uh, virus and other contagions could get through um, and that's why actually uh, for the general population probably the best thing for them is to wear um, a cloth face covering either a mask or or one of a scarf bandana or something like that where it really does cover the mouth and nose and really gets around the face um, a little bit better than those N95s that that need to be worn uh, correctly. All right, next we have News Center, Maine. Uh, Beth and Hannah, I'll unmute you both, and whoever would like to ask a question for News Center, Maine can go ahead and do so now. I'll start. Dr. Jarvis, hi. Uh, you mentioned a few minutes ago that you're seeing uh, medical, or you're seeing uh, protective gear that's not medical grade. Uh, we're hearing a lot about people, companies, uh, switching their 3D printers over printing masks, shields, um, various things. Is there some kind of uh, standard that they have to meet? And is there a process for them to do that before they're used in the hospital? So unfortunately, I can't comment on that particularly because I just don't know what the regulations are. I will tell you that for what we purchase, um, we are purchasing products that we then do internal testing on. We have done testing with our partners at the University of Maine as well as with other healthcare partners around the state uh, to make sure that if somebody was, was uh, creating something that we would use for our own healthcare providers, um, that we felt that it met a standard that would offer the protection that, we, that, that is required for our healthcare providers to keep them safe. So if you were to see um, uh, one of our employees wearing a face shield, that would be that, cl that clear plastic covering in front of their mask. Um, that is something that we have had tested and validated that it does provide the security and safety that, that we need. So that's what, we, that's what we have been doing for that. I can't talk about what's out there on, on the marketplace though. Okay, okay. Um, and then I guess if you could talk a little bit different, but um, we're hearing a lot about a second wave um, like there was the Spanish flu. And are you preparing for that already? Are, or what kind of preparations are being made? Or is it too early for that? Or is that something that you're, you're already thinking about? Um, so the question was, is are we preparing for a second wave um, if that happens like what happened in many areas uh, during the 1918-1919 uh, influenza pandemic? 
Um, and so the answer to that for myself, who has been one that, that, that has worked in emergency preparedness for much of my career, um, I always prepare for the next thing. In fact, yesterday I, I, we were talking about a subject and I said, I understand you're talking about today, but that's not what worries me. It's tomorrow that worries me. Um, so yes, we, we continue to have our processes in place like we always do for emergency preparedness. Um, across Northern Light and our facilities, you know, we prepare for, for emergencies, disasters, um, car accidents, things like that on a regular basis. And so this is just one one more effort that we are preparing for. As far as for a second wave, if we were to have one, um, we are fortunate again in the state of Maine that our overall numbers of patients who have required uh, hospitalization has been low. And so the things that we prepared for for a large wave and influx of patients um, back in February, we are still have that, those same opportunities and the same uh, procedures and plans in place, except that now we're, we're, we're more um, used to using them because we've been using them for the last few months. So I think we're even more ready um, if that were to occur. The best thing we can do though is try to prevent it. And that's why it's important for us to continue doing that social distancing um, and, and wearing face coverings when we are out in public and limiting our uh, being out in public to really essential travel um, to grocery stores, uh, your health care provider, and things like that. And please, if you are having health issues whatsoever, um, please reach out to your health care providers. This is not the time for you to neglect your diabetes or your heart disease or your um, lung disease. It is important for you to, to uh, check in and make sure that you're still doing well um, and, uh, and heeding the advice of your caregivers. Okay, next we'll go to Kate Koff, Ellsworth American. So two questions, one for Dr. Jarvis and uh, here's for Mr. Bolin. Um, the first is, can you talk a little bit about what your supply of um, dialysis equipment and staff to run those machines look like? Um, I ask because I'm sure you're aware that we've had a couple, you know, a more, uh, numerous reports of um, places in the country where they're seeing a lot of kidney failure and cardiac issues that go along with uh, COVID-19. So that's my first question. Um, my second question, um, I'm wondering if you could talk in, uh, about whether or not you've come to an agreement with the uh, medical technicians at Northern Light Maine Coast. Um, I know there was, you know, that, that there's been a, you've been in contract agreements for a couple of years now, and I was wondering where we were on that. So thanks, Kate. I'll answer the first question. Um, uh, regarding dialysis, then turn it over to Paul for the for your second question. So the question was: Is do we do we feel that we have enough um, dialysis capabilities and uh, staff? So I will say that Northern Light Health does not do its own dialysis. We contract out with a company called Davida. Um, we work with them on a regular basis, uh, and I have uh, we are not aware of any um, limitations other than the fact that they have concerns like other facilities um, and uh, and are probably asking the same kind of questions that we are, uh, making sure that people are not symptomatic before utilizing their facilities, and if so, making sure that they isolate them appropriately so that within their own um, facility that they limit the spread. And so, uh, but right now, our relationship with Davida remains good, and we continue to provide the care that we need to for those individuals. Thank you for that question. And the uh, second question was regarding uh, contract negotiations uh, with a technical uh, union at Maine Coast uh, Memorial uh, or Maine Coast Hospital, Northern Light Maine Coast. And uh, those negotiations are ongoing, and uh, we have uh, our next scheduled bargaining date. Uh, I believe it's in the first week of May, uh, if memory serves me right. And uh, we have a technical unit of about 32 employees uh, at that hospital. Uh, and we continue to negotiate in good faith uh, with them and, and are optimistic that we'll be able to reach terms that uh, both parties can agree upon. Thank you both. You're welcome. All right, and last but not least today we have Molly Shelley, Morning Sentinel. So the question is, has been there there been a lot of overtime? Um, overtime generally has been lower uh, overall as a system. Certainly there are some areas uh, such as respiratory medicine, uh, intensive care, emergency department, and other uh, groups where overtime may have uh, bubbled up. I'm not uh, aware of the specifics of each department's overtime, uh, uh, but generally speaking, our workforce uh, is busy with plenty to do. 
uh, and um, you know, to the extent there is overtime, uh, it's not uh, surpassing a normal level at this point. Great, that's all I have. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, well, that concludes question and answer session for today.